and gentlemen, let me welcome you to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. Really glad you're here today. We are going to discuss MGTOW, WIGTOW, and the Bible today. MGTOW, for those of you that don't know, is an acronym that means men going their own way. And at the same time, WIGTOW is women going their own way. We're going to talk about these two ideas from a biblical perspective. So hang in there. Listen in strong, but before we do, let's pray. Father God, we just want to praise and thank you for your goodness toward us, your loving kindnesses, your tender mercies. We thank you for teaching us from your word today and showing us the way, showing us what we should do with our lives and how we should live, whether we should marry or not, whether we should interact with the opposite sex or not, and how we should do so in such a way that is totally derived from your biblical mandates and your your laws and and the way that you would have us as your children to behave with one another. We thank you for teaching us to love each other, that love is the greatest of all things. It, the, the two great commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself as the second, and those comprise the entirety of the law. And so help us to love other people, Lord. We praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name and right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I come against, bind up, rebuke, and command to leave me in this studio, any demonic spirit that would try to attack me or to try to prevent me from giving a message that is uh, proper and right. I bind up your influences on me in any way, shape, or form. And Father God, I ask that you let no flesh speak. Let only your spirit be heard from today so that people can actually get helped and deliverance. I praise you and thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I bind up any demonic spirits from interfering with the listener's experience with regard to this message. I bind up any demons from uh, setting the standard of how each listener thinks or trying to control uh, the doctrine here in the mind and the ears of a listener. I bind you up in Jesus' mighty name from planting ideas in the listener's mind that are not from God or trying to twist the words I'm saying in the mind of a listener to cause them to misunderstand or to take things the wrong way or to even act out in a wrong way as a result of listening to this podcast. I bind that up, rebuke it, and command it to be made nullified in Jesus' mighty name. And Father God, I just once again praise you and thank you for your presence. This is your podcast Take over, run the show, and we praise you and thank you for doing so. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I wanted to come to you today with this idea of MGTOW and WIGTOW. You know, there's so many videos and channels on YouTube about MGTOW, which is men going their own way. And, and I've seen some, some videos on WIGTOW too popping up. They're not as uh, much of interest for me, obviously, being a man. But I've watched a lot of MGTOW videos because of, you know, the shared experience that we've all been through in that you, you're, you're left alone a lot of times by interacting with a Jezebel spirited person or a narcissistic spirited person. And at the end, you kind of look for ways to break free from the opposite sex or relations with a person of the same gender from which you've been hurt by that Jezebel narcissistic spirit. And so MGTOW or WIGTOW becomes very attractive to you because of the fact that you, <laughs> you're you commiserating with a bunch of people that have been hurt. And so their reaction is to, is their knee-jerk reaction is to bristle, to back off, to stay away from the source of the pain, which is that gender. And the problem with that, and we'll talk more about this later on in the broadcast, is that you can't do that because not everyone in that gender is guilty of what happened to you. And so there are other things about MGTOW or WIGTOW that would cause a person to want to follow some of its tenets because it causes you to more fully want to develop yourself as an individual without a relationship. And encourage your own development as a human being by yourself without others. And that is one of the good things about MGTOW or WIGTOW, I guess, although, like I said, I'm not as familiar with that. MGTOW 
one of the good things that it does, and believe me, it does a lot of bad, which is why in the end, I'm not going to tell ever anyone to follow after MGTOW because in so many ways it's unbiblical, but unless you go MGTOW monk mode, but even then it causes you to um, think on women in such a way that I don't think that God would intend you to. But we'll go into more details about the negatives after we talk about the positives. But the positives of MGTOW are it encourages you to find your center in what your purpose is in life. And so from a secular standpoint, MGTOW uh, men, their, their focus is, as far as the pluses are, you know, to develop your own skills, develop a trade, develop hobbies, um, seek out what your role is in life and try to find your purpose and what you're best at doing. So instead of giving all your time to trying to seek out dates or or marriage or trying to fashion yourself as someone that would be what you perceive to be attractive to the opposite sex, MGTOW basically says, focus on your on, on improvement of your own situation. And in the end, if you want a, a proper woman, you will have worked on yourself and tried to improve yourself in so much that you make yourself a more viable candidate for marriage. And there is a parallel to that in scripture that if you, in my view, that if you seek after God and making yourself right with him, and the person that you end up courting has done the same, then the best possible outcome for your marriage will be that you both have a relationship with God first and foremost, and then you can um, serve each other better because you both know God. And from a secular standpoint, MGTOW is, at least from the man's perspective, is all about uh, self-development, advancement in career, advancement in your hobbies and the things that you love and not sacrificing those on the altar of getting married to potentially a selfish person that's going to uh, rob you of all these things that you enjoy and love and, and zap your life force from you. And that's the way they present it. But uh, that's not what I believe a godly marriage would produce. Uh, a godly marriage should produce where both people are drawing closer to the Lord and encouraging one another in their relationship with God. And in so doing, that causes... Um, both of the people involved to raise their game, as it were. A rising tide raises all ships. The key to that is being equally yoked. And we'll talk more about that later. On the other side of that is that many people that believe in MGTOW believe that you should use women and, uh, for sex, and that's it. Don't let them come over. Don't let them get too involved. If they call you, don't call them back for a couple of days. It's all the games that people play in dating. It's basically trying to make a woman uh, want to do anything to to stay in your life because you're constantly nudging her out a little bit, and that's the whole mindset behind some some MGTOW men is that they figure if they play the game, they'll get to have sex as much as possible uh, with the least amount of cost to them. And that's not all MGTOW people because there's categories of MGTOW. There's like the MGTOW pickup artist. There's the MGTOW a uh, monk who doesn't have anything to do with women at all and they just stay to themselves. And so there's people that follow men going their own way and I assume women going their own way at different places on the scale, but ultimately they're not looking to get married and they're going to get their sexual need, needs met even by prostitutes or one night stands. Um, the holiness of matrimony is completely disregarded by that faction of MGTOW. They don't see that sexual interaction should only be by a mar married uh, couple, a husband and a wife. And that is the very most absolute dangerous aspect of that, because if you've watched my Soul Ties video, or if you know anything about how we become knitted together as one with each and every person that we have sex with, and then that open, opens the channels for demons to pass back and forth between you and everyone you slept with, you then realize how dangerous it is to uh, fornicate. And the Bible's really clear on fornication and, and that we are not to do it, and that fornication actually causes us to sin against our own bodies. So if you come with me to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, it says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. 
What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have received of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So you are sinning against your own body. You know, it's funny. I mean, I'm, you can't always draw this correlation, but I've, I've known a lot of people that have been single for most of their lives, and they all look so young. There's just something to people that fornicate that it's almost like... It's almost like life stealing in a way. It almost takes away your your life in the sense that you're having sex is almost like expending life every time you do it. So we see here that fornication is a sin against our own body. So that aspect of MGTOW, it's not good. And and but it's the positive attributes of MGTOW that cause us not to um, focus on trying to find a spouse that actually helps us to improve. And there's plenty of stuff in the Bible about that. And we're not worried about it, self-improvement for the sake of self-improvement. Like MGTOW, people are often worried about how much money they can make and save and how if they don't have a, a girlfriend or a wife or children, they can focus on that and get rich and have lots of money. And that's not why we do it. Because as we're all well familiar, Jesus said that you cannot serve God in mammon. But there's a lot into in the scriptures about actually being single and how one can serve a God better if you're single. So let me take you to a scripture about that. So if you come with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 32, you'll see here it says, But I would, I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. So when you're a MGTOW and not a Christian, you're more worried about building your own kingdom, getting money, getting wealth, getting power. But as for us as Christians, as people that are not seeking to get married, that are just uh, remaining unmarried, we can focus on the Lord and doing his works and serving him. Whereas uh, Paul argues here that if you're married, you're going to have to care for the things of this world, how you can please your wife, how you can provide for her, how you can put a roof over her head. Unless you think that men are the only ones that Paul says this to, look what he says to women. He says in verse 34, there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So here you have the same idea that she can uh, be focused on God and serving Him, but once she's married, she needs to figure out, you know, what is she going to do to um, provide the reciprocal relationship that a man and woman have? Is she going to look after the home or try to be a Proverbs 31 woman and, you know, have all these things going on that are, are meant to sustain the family and to raise children and all that? Whereas a single person can uh, seek to serve God and to and to help him and to be a servant and it's much more difficult when you're married now many people seek to that are in ministry seek to have a spouse that's equally as interested in in serving the lord and if that's the case which i personally have never seen two people on the same level or wavelength in that area i'm not saying it doesn't exist i just haven't been exposed to it i just have my own anecdotal evidence for that so maybe if you're a in a husband wife team that's just really doing a amazing works for for God and serving him and doing ministry maybe leave a comment and encourage the rest of us about that but you know I haven't really seen that myself I've seen a lot of people say they want that but it's it's been difficult for them to find such a situation and they seem to be people that remain single for a long long time uh, in their lives because deep inside they're they're really wanting to serve God now that doesn't mean that they don't want Per, a person of the opposite sex on some level, but they're they're containing it. They're containing it with the help of God. Look what Paul wrote in First Corinthians seven verse six. He said, "For I would that all men were even as I myself." He was single, but every man hath his proper gift of God. One after this manner, and another after that. And we're going to talk about it being a gift in a second. And he says, "I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them to abide if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn." So he's saying here, it's better to remain single, but if you're going to burn in lust. While you're single, 
and you don't get control of it, you don't, uh, you by the spirit overcome um, the desire of the flesh uh, to have sex and to, to do so, it's way better to get married than to have lust in your heart or to have a fleshly desires or to, you know, somehow get caught up and go to a prostitute or, or, or have one night stands or whatever. And then it's just, it's just so much better to be married, but it's getting married is not without a cost because the, and the cost is the focus on the spouse rather than on God. And I'm not saying, you know, that ministers can't focus on God, but it can become more difficult. And if you don't have a spouse that's supportive of it, that if you don't have, you know, your wife, if you're a man, male minister, or your husband, if you're a female minister, um, ministering to other women, if you've got to focus a lot on that person, it's hard to tend to the things of God, harder, harder to tend to the things of God. It's not that you can't, but there's definitely added layers of responsibility that make it a little more difficult. So now I want to go back to this idea that Paul presents. He says, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. So he's saying that some people are gifted to be singles and others aren't. And a lot of times single people look on being single as a curse and not a gift. But it is a gift. And you can ask a lot of your married friends whether or not it's a gift or not. And even Jesus put it that way. Jesus uh, was talking to his disciples about divorce. And I've read this from the scripture a lot of times where um, the Pharisees and Sadducees ask him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? You know, to write out a divorce, a paper of divorcement, to give to your wife, to put her away. And Jesus responded, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wife. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is uh, put away, committeth, causeth her to commit adultery. So you see that, that problem there, that Jesus sets the bar really high on marriage and that we're only to... Uh, divorce if there's been fornication. Some people argue with me about that, but I'm just going to go with what it says in the red letters and that if there's fornication, you can divorce your wife or your husband uh, because I believe that breaks the covenant. But I'm not going to go over that again. That's like been in like six uh, podcasts already. But I will say that when he said this to them, to the, his disciples, his disciples said to them, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is, it is not good to marry. So they're sitting there saying, basically, in modern parlance, they all went, dang. They were like, no. I mean, they were, that can't be. They're like, if the case be so with his, with his wife, it is not good to marry. They're like, no, marriage isn't even an option if that's the case. But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. Do you see that to remain single as Jesus did, as Paul did, as as Jeremiah was uh, told to by God, that they did so because uh, it was given to them. It's a gift to be able to live without lust as a single person is a gift. And here he goes on to describe eunuchs. He said, for there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, that is, they're unable to copulate or have sexual, uh, have sex uh, because of some kind of birth quote, we'll call it a defect. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. So there were people who had their testes castrated uh, that were in the king's courts that uh, worked with the women, you know, the harems and whatnot. Those typically were eunuchs. Jezebel had eunuchs working for her. And so because they were castrated, they knew that those men would not try to um, copulate or fornicate with uh, the women. So, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So again, eunuch, it typically means that the person's been uh, castrated, but there, you don't have to be castrated to be a eunuch. You can just practice self-control and, and uh, use the gifts of the spirit, you know, the power of the spirit to overcome the works of the flesh. You walk in the spirit so you don't uh, do the works of the flesh. And that's how a person remains single and does not um, give in or acquiesce to, to lust. And the only way to do that is, in my view, unless you're just born with the gift of just being basically asexual, is to really um, be prayerful, read the Bible every day, be walking in the Spirit. You know, I'm just going to be brutally honest with you. I mean, I've been single for most of my life. I mean, I, 
I became a Christian at 24, and prior to that, I did what people of the world do, and I did uh, fornicate outside of marriage, and it was really wrong, and then I repented. And then um, there have been times in my walk where, as a Christian, where I've just dated a few people, and I I did not have good self-control, just being honest with you. I regret that for myself. It's not that I went and had full on sex with a lot of people, but I, I crossed lines and I repent for that. I've had, I have repented for that. And that's why it says here, Paul writes, he says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So he's saying that if you want to remain single, you better not touch a, a woman. There's no point if you're single to be kissing a woman or for if you're a woman to be kissing a man or touching a man because once your baser self your fleshly self what what your body takes over it's going to do what it wants to do or it's going to try to lead you to and then it won't, once you've gone too far as jesus said the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and the flesh is going to really enjoy it I mean, sex, sex is fun for a reason. God made it that way. You have to, you know, so that, you know, people would procreate and come together. And God's not saying it's for everyone to be single. And I'm not trying to tell everyone here that you need to be single. But I am saying that if, if you are trying to go that route, if you do feel God leading you down that route, you don't need to be touching someone of the opposite sex. You don't need to be in a dating situation where you're having physical interactions with somebody. So then Paul goes on to write next. He said, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and every, let every woman have her own husband. So he's saying here that if, if, if fornication is a possibility in your life, you need to be married. And I always felt like, you know, here I am, 47. I always felt like God was going to provide me <laughs> with, with a wife so that, you know, permanently so that I would not... Uh, have to fornicate that was always my my goal but it just wasn't i wasn't evidently meant to be with anybody at least right now and so he writes about that he also you know this is the scripture where he talks about that the the let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband he's saying you need to provide for each other's sexual needs there. And he says, The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power over of his body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So he's saying, if you are married, you need to not use sex as a weapon, but actually provide uh, sex to one another so that you don't get tempted to go elsewhere. A lot of times when people turn off the sex, a married couple, one person turns off the sex to the other and makes the other beg. And uh, they're used to being able to have sex because they're married and there's that expectation. That's, that can actually cause a temptation and for them to stray. So it's very important that if you are married that you do um, participate in the act with your spouse and the power's not over your own body, that you're to let them have sex when they want to, unless you're sick or something. I'm not, I'm, come on, I'm not trying to say that there aren't times where you, you can't you know, say no and the person should understand. But more often than not, you should be having sex when, the, when your spouse wants it, according to Scripture. So here we see, getting, getting on to women, we see that wo- the woman is happier if she remains single, as well as the man, as long as she can contain. So we see here that uh, in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, it says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to marry to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide, he's saying single, after my judgment, and I think also to have the Spirit of God. So he's saying there that a woman could be happier if she doesn't marry, because let's face it, it just gives you a whole bunch of other responsibilities that the simple life for him he was pure MGTOW in the sense that he was he he still interacted with women. I'm not saying that on you know as a minister, but he because he didn't have a wife, he could just get up and go to Macedonia when he had a dream. He could return to Jerusalem when he felt uh, the need to do so. He, he did he traveled all over the place, and he didn't have to worry about the comfort of his wife or anything like that. He he and he had learned to be content in whatever state he was, and so. You know, that was just an easier situation for him. But he's even saying for women that they could be happier if they weren't married. But if you can't contain yourself and you want to have sex so much 
that you can't contain and you're living in a lustful state, the scripture is here saying that you need to marry. So he says here in 1 Corinthians 7, 36, but if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, so he's talking about a, a female in his household that's a virgin. He says, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. So back then, oftentimes people would have, a man might have a female servant living in his house and he's not married to her, she's not married to him. But once she became of age and he felt, if he felt attraction toward her that wasn't really controllable, uh, he, he's saying that it's better for you to marry. Then he says, Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath, the power over his, hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So he says he's doing well if he keeps the virgin in the house. If he doesn't have sex with her and he can contain, he's saying this is even better. So then he says, So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. So he's saying the better thing is to be single. But if you can't contain, you do well as, as well. You know, it says in the Proverbs that the man that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And I think it can be said for women. A woman that findeth a husband findeth a good thing. As long as it's in the will of God and it's given over to you to be married, I think that you can have a very complete experience. I mean, having children, I mean, all of those things are amazing and they're not to be denigrated or discounted. You know, and I don't want this message to do that. And I, and I don't want to twist these scriptures of Paul to make it, you know, he continually says it's better to be single to serve the Lord. But at the same time, I have to say that you can understand God better as a father if you become a father, I think. And you can know, understand the kind of love that he has for us when you feel that love yourself. So, and I don't want to put off that being married is going to put the death knell on your ministry either. If you have a supportive spouse, and encouraging and more than encouraging that even helps drive you to to pursue the things of God that's even better now one thing that both Jesus and Paul talked about was that there is no marriage in eternity if you come with me to Matthew 22 Jesus was answering uh the Sadducees that gave him this this hypothetical situation where there's where there's a woman who marries a man who's the youngest of seven brothers, and he dies. So the next one has to marry her. That was part of the, uh, the Torah, that if, if a man is a brother and he is not married, he must take the, brothers, the brother who dies, he must take her, her as his wife and raise up a child under his, his uh, dead brother's name. And in this example, there were seven brothers and they all died, and they asked Jesus, well, which one... Uh, wh which one of these men would she take in the resurrection? And he said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So where we're going, eternity, we're not going to be married. We're not going to have a need for sex. We're not going to have the desire to, I mean, I was about to get vulgar, but to put our our private parts together. That's not going to be part of our future. And Paul reiterates that as well. He says here, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. So he's saying that what he's reiterating what Jesus said, that in our time is much shorter now than it was when he was here. The time is short right now. We are living in a time that many people think is about to begin the tribulation period. And um, this, this obsession with being married or this obsession of having a, a, a better half, as some people call it, or a soulmate, or all these things that movies and books constantly lift up to be, you know, the end-all, beat-all. It's not, because in eternity, we're not even going to be that way. It's not even going to be something we even consider. We'll be like the angels. And I know many of you listening are thinking, man, I can't imagine a life without it, because sex is an addiction for many people. Sex is uh, a nirvana. It's a euphoria. It's a place uh, spiritually that you can't seem to get any other way. And it's like a drug for many people listening. But when your body has no need of it, it's like those of you that have never done drugs, you can't understand how someone's addicted to drugs when uh, you don't need it at all. You've never done it. But if you had done it or if you had an addictive uh, personality or addictive spirits, demonic spirits, and had tried drugs, you couldn't imagine an eternity without drugs. 
they have a hard time imagining today without drugs those people are trying to recover from drug addiction so i believe it's the same with sex once the desire is not there once you're in a spiritual body that's not hardwired to do it then you're not going to need it and that's what they're saying is like we've made sex and so important we've made romance so important I mean, you think about all those movies like The Notebook and, you know, since the beginning of time, there's been romantic uh, fictions written, romantic fiction that's been written that just deifies this idea of the man and woman together. And uh, I'm not saying that it's not something that God doesn't utilize and can't uh, show his greatness of his love through it. But I am saying that we've made it too important, and it's too important in the church. And I even see in the church that the family, the entity of the family is deified and put above uh, God. You know, Jesus said, if you love your mother or father or your sister or your brother, your son or your daughter, your wife, your husband more than him, you're not worthy of him. And we, and he even said that he came not to bring peace but a sword. He said that that father would be against son and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and a man's foes would be they of the of his own house and uh so i just say all that to say that first i think this is why many people are in marriages that are disintegrating right now because the spirit of jezebel and the narcissistic spirit uh is just causing so much havoc in families and in churches that people that are trying to walk the walk and live out scripture you know, from from Genesis to Revelation, they're trying to live that out. Their spouses uh, that are narcissistic or Jezebel are really bucking, and uh, many people are splitting apart right now. I'm just seeing it so much in uh, my ministry. But I say all that to say that it's just it's too deified by the church. This the idea of marriage and children and the family unit, and that deification of a false idol, which it is, that false idol is, a, is crumbling right now. Uh, you know that in the church, it has the same divorce rates as outside of the church, 50 plus percent. And the rates of um, adultery are just as high. And so you can just see that people, not everybody that calls themselves a Christian is a Christian. And, you know, a lot of people that think themselves to be saints are ain'ts. And that's a big problem. But a lot of it does stem from the fact that we have deified marriage. And so I'm not trying to denigrate marriage at all or family. I'm not trying to do that. But I am saying that that the scriptures point out that it is a gift to be single. And if you can just get a hold, if, if it's supposed to be your gift and you're struggling, if you can just get a hold of your sexuality, if you can just start to walk in the spirit, and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you can start to rebuke, bind up, and command to leave you demonic spirits of lust, there's a good chance that you can live it out without having feeling necessary, without feeling that you're required to marry someone else to satisfy yourself. And I'm just encouraging you to just pray about it in your life. Are you supposed to be a person that's single? Are you supposed to be a person that's loving God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and focused on him and helping others. If that's you, and you can uh, stay unmarried without burning in lust, that's a gift. So you need to stop seeing it as a curse, but it's a gift. You have so much freedom. And there's a lot of married people that may be listening that are saying, man, the grass is greener on the other side. Married people often want to be single, and single people often want to be married. But it's important that we stay in our hearts in a situation where we are content in whatever state that God has us in. So look here in 1 Corinthians 7, 27. It says, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. So he's saying that whatever situation you're in, be content in that situation. Now, I am not trying to cause anybody whose heart's desire is to be married to lose that desire or to not want to see that fulfilled. I'm just saying that some of us have made an idol of it and we want to be married for the wrong reasons. And 
we would actually be much happier staying single. But we're so focused on being married that and on that idea that we're not even enjoying what we've got, the gift we've got of being single. You know, I've I've wanted to be married since I was like six years old, and I have not had any success in that area at all. And um, I will say that when I finally got to where I realized that I could just keep doing the things I wanted, like, for example, I like to play music, and I like to play guitar, and I like to record my music, and I like to try to play for other people. And uh, I, I was a tennis coach. And these, these things, playing guitar and tennis, are really difficult. You know, I don't want to just blow them up too much, but tennis is a, is a, it's really hard. I mean, you can't just go out and play tennis uh, and get the ball back in the lines if you don't have instruction or, and haven't practiced. You know, they say that with anything hard like music or a sport like tennis that, or golf or, you know, your jump shot or whatever sports in general that takes 10,000 hours to become um, proficient where your muscle memory doesn't have to think about what you're doing. And that's a lot of, if you do it three or four hours a day, you know, five days a week, uh, 50 weeks a year with two weeks off, that's only about a thousand hours a year. That's 10 years at a thousand hours uh, to get to 10,000 hours to be good and, and, and have mastery of something difficult like music or, or sports. And I don't even know if if I've attained to the 10,000 hours in either thing. Well, tennis probably for sure, but in music, maybe I don't know where I am. I'm not really counting. But the point I'm trying to make is that I had the, the, the time to pursue that. And way more important than that, I had time to study the scriptures and read the Bible without, you know, having to wake up really early for some other responsibility that I had to attend to. So I could really study out the Bible and read it and make these podcasts and, and you know, do all these things that I feel God leading me to do. And uh, just recording, I've been recording the music since 2010-ish or so. So here we are eight years in and I'm still consider myself novice intermediate. So it takes, it takes a lot of practice and experience to record to get to where you're even passable at it. and. I Like I say, I mean, I just don't think if I was married that entire time that I'd be where I am right now. So I I think that's the crux of MGTOW. That's the attractive aspect of MGTOW to me that made me, that I kind of used MGTOW, what I learned of it, to solidify those ideas in my heart that I could pursue God, that I could pursue these other things that I'm using for God, like the music and everything else. And that I could I'd have the time to really give myself over to those things. And I just would not have been able to do that if I was married. And, you know, on, on some level, that would, have, that would have been sacrificed. You know, your wife um, deserves your attention if you're married. She does. And she deserves, and you deserve her attention. And there's going to be times where you're developing your relationship and all that's really important. Again, I'm not denigrating it, but I'm just saying there are benefits to being single to those of you that are single and may not even want to be. If you'll just take advantage of this time and use it to serve God and to figure out your his purpose for you and to walk in that purpose, maybe it's then that once you've gotten to that place that you will get your spouse. You know, I'm not saying to, to do that uh, as the motivation to get a spouse, do it because you want to serve God. And then, and then maybe the time will be right and you'll be in the proper place where you can be the spouse that God wants you to be, you know, and there's a proverb and I know this applies to men here, but it says the words of King Lemuel, this is proverb 31. It says the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. So you see, she's saying that how can you be a king and focus on um, entertaining women too much? And it, it could be the same thing for women too with men. I mean, how can you be God's ma- a handmaiden if you're focused too much on dating and looking after men and, you know, Jesus and Paul were the ultimate MGTOWs. But 
here's the difference and here's the bad aspect of MGTOW. MGTOW actually does, spends a lot of time talking negatively about women. And women and men can be Jezebels and narcissists. And if you f- believe that every woman is a Jezebel and every man's a narcissist, then you're going to be divided and it's Satan's divide and conquer tactic. And I think he's using MGTOW to do that. He's using MGTOW and WIGTOW to divide and conquer us. So just because I'm single doesn't mean I, I don't interact with women. I'm not trying to not help women or minister to women. I'm trying, I am doing so in a way that's uh, more uh, protective. You know, I don't want anybody myself included to fall into a situation where things get questionable, you know, from a less perspective. But this does not mean for me that I can't interact with women and have um, communication with women. I'm not trying to be friends with women in the sense of like really good friends for me. I know that um, I do have women that I've known for years that uh, are are friends, but I've known them for many, many years. And for me, I'm just not going out and looking to make female friends because if there's any attraction, there's going to be the potential for um, crossing crossing the line. And for me, I mean, I've crossed the line in, the, in my past and I know that others have crossed the line with me and I just know it's better for me personally to keep myself from that. I don't want to sin against God or myself or the other person. And I'm not even talking about having sex all the way. I'm I'm just talking about petting and kissing and and stuff like that because you know you go one little step uh, one day and you've just kissed and the next day you're doing your rounding the bases if you know what I mean. You may not go all the way home, but you're doing stuff that's getting you into a a, 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 a situation where you're doing something with someone that you shouldn't be doing and you're not married to that person and that's you shouldn't be crossing the line with a person that you're not married to so you know that's why paul said it's good not to touch a woman and that's why and for you women it's good for you not to touch a man look what look what uh this is written by solomon look what he wrote he said he said i applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly even of foolishness and madness and i find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands is bands so he's talking about jezebel there the seductress and he says you know her heart is to snare you to to draw you into the net and her hands are like bands that are wrapping around you like delilah wrapped up um samson you know, before he had his hair cut and his eyes, his eyes uh, plucked out or burned out. And he says, um, Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. So he's saying, you know, he's saying, basically, you definitely want to flee from the fornicating, adulterous woman. And same with you women, the, the dog of a man, the whoremonger, the man that is trying to get you to sleep with him. And because you won't, won't he sees you as a challenge. And, and the more he's with you, the more he's trying to tempt you. And suddenly you're drawn into a sin. And women have to be just as careful as men. So Paul goes on, not Paul, excuse me. Solomon goes on, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. So he's saying for himself that he's found a decent-hearted man, one in a thousand. It's a pretty low ratio there. But he hasn't found a woman in that sense. And so I think, you know, I've seen a lot of Christian ministers that are single that, that want to be married, and they always say the same thing. They say, oh, I want someone that has the same zeal and same drive uh, for the ministry as I do. And I know there are women out there that are like that. But these men have a very hard time finding that person because it's hard to find. You can find someone maybe equally yoked in the sense that they uh, believe on God and they're saved and born again. But to find someone to come up aside you in the ministry and want it as much as you, that is like finding a great a pearl of great price. I mean, look here um, in this Proverbs thirty one. Proverbs thirty one woman says, "Who can find a virtuous woman for a price as far above rubies? Rubies are tremendously valuable, 
The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that she shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also wise yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Ladies up before dawn feeding everybody. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard. So she's planting vineyards. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. I mean, she works with her hands like a chat. In verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax, worketh willingly with her hands. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth out, not out by night. So this woman's staying up late into the night and her merchandise, what does that mean? She knows that she's a beautiful woman and her husband is, uh, she's going to um, be with him in the night and then wake up early and do all those things. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. It just goes on and on. I mean, this woman is unbelievable. And I think that we should all set the bar really high to be that type of person for God first, and then for each other. Oh, man. Proverbs 31 is a high bar. I didn't even read all of it. But you notice at the very end, verse 30, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. You know, MGTOW talks about the wall, that women hit the wall at a certain age and they're not beauty, beautiful anymore and they can't use their beauty to entice men anymore. And, you know, they're talking about Jezebels. And it's... Basically, it says that very same thing here. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Beauty is vain. doesn't last forever. Beauty doesn't last forever. And so this Proverbs 31 woman has something that came in from the inside that made her, made her to provide for her family and to, to do um, so many things for her family and for the community. That's what made her great. And it says so here, in verse 29, or verse 28. Let's go to verse 27, actually. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. It's about service. Service to, to God first and your neighbor second. So what is the conclusion of all this? Well, this whole MGTOW movement, I really truly believe it's meant to divide and conquer us. It's meant to make men hate women and to look at all the Jezebel women out there that are using men and chewing them up and spitting them out to justify them doing the same thing. Because those that are MGTOW pickup artists and MGTOW users of women that will only sleep with women but have nothing else to do with them, that's just as bad as what the Jezebels are doing. So there's a huge swath of that movement that says to do that. And then there's the MGTOW monks that won't even like interact with women at work or anywhere else. They feel betrayed. They've been betrayed by that Jezebel spirit and they are not going to do it again. But I'm telling you that as a Christian, there are people from every um, nation, tongue, and kindred, and tribe so that's all races that are in the kingdom. And there are male and female in the kingdom. And we have to recognize each other on a spiritual level and deal with each other on a spiritual level and love one another and look after each other. Even if we're not married, we need to minister to others, to minister, minister to God first and then others second. And if you are caught up in racial divide and conquer or gender divide and conquer or the MGTOW movement in such a way that you just throw the baby out with the bathwater and you hate all women as a MGTOW or you hate all men as a WIGTOW or a feminist, then you've fallen into a trap and snare of the devil. But the devil is using some truth within MGTOW about developing yourself Except he's, you know, I mentioned earlier, develop yourself to make yourself wealthy or more skilled or more knowledgeable or to travel or this and that. But again, we as Christians, as Christian people that love God, whether we're single or married, our job is to serve God first and foremost. 
And so I, I find that what the MGTOW movement did for me in learning about it was it just encouraged me that I can stay single, that I can, you know, along with the scriptures, that I can redeem the time and not have to be married. I can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that doesn't mean that I have to throw away every um, possible contact with a, with a woman just because I'm not going to have a physical relationship or, or, or get married again unless I feel God wants me to. Um, I can live this single life for as long as I need to. And like I've said in past messages, I feel like we're in getting really close to the tribulation period and that Ezekiel 38 war is going to start it. And once that war happens, three and a half years later, the Antichrist is going to take power. And then three and a half years after that, Jesus is coming back, I believe, according to the scriptures. So we don't really have a whole bunch of time. So if Russia, Turkey, or Iran and Iraq and Libya and these other nations, they all come against Israel and five out of six of them die, according to Ezekiel 38 and 39. I believe that's starting the tribulation and that war could happen tomorrow. Iran and Iraq and, excuse me, Iran, Turkey and Russia just made a public pact last month. So I don't think any of these things are are beyond possibility. So having said all that, I feel like I can make it and... That's not to say that I'm not tempted. I have to be really careful about what websites I go to. Uh, like if I go to like a news aggregator like Drudge Report, every single site that he links to has half-naked women in their, in their um, lingerie um, on the page. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to say that that stuff has no power to affect me if I let it. I need to just be careful about that. And, uh, you know, it just, I just think that if, I can personally, I'm talking for myself and maybe this testimony can help you. MGTOW has helped me to think that, yeah, I can remain single, but I'm not, I'm not going to adopt all of their uh, radical beliefs, but just the idea that um, being, being single and developing my relationship with God and doing ministry, you know, that's a very biblical idea. And uh, I'm not going to lie, those videos did help me, especially in the wake of what I went through. So... I'm saying for you that that don't use MGTOW to, to, to justify yourself. Just use the scriptures that I just read to you. Go back, write them all down, and, and go back and study them for yourself and see if it's, up, if it's for you to remain single right now. You know, it talks about in the tribulation, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 24 that woe unto them that have, that, that have child and give suck in those days. And give suck means that, you know, breastfeeding in those days because you're going to have to flee. So in that sense, too, it's better for to not be married and procreating at the moment because it's going to, to be hard to, to, to uh, carry children and, and, and move about uh, freely. So he even warned about that. So, you know, consider these things. I'm not trying to tell you not to get married. I'm just trying to tell you that if you are single and you don't understand why God's not allowing you to get married, to cut yourself some slack, you're not cursed. You may be blessed at this time in history to not have children. You may be blessed to not be married at this moment. And you may be blessed to be able to serve God and stop seeing it as a curse against you and start seeing it as being blessed. You are blessed. Believe me, you're blessed. Married people are just as blessed. I'm not trying to weigh one out against the other, but I am saying that if you are single and it's God, God's will for you and you even enjoy it, then enjoy it all the more. Quit denigrating yourself for not being married and don't allow anybody in the world to do it because that's just the enemy messing with you. You just continue to trust God and serve him and, and live the single life uh, for as long as you feel led to and you feel that it is his, God's desire for your life. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast and I hope I didn't get too confusing. And let's go ahead and and, and leave out with some prayer. Father God, I praise you and thank you for this podcast. I praise you and thank you for your presence here. I thank you for encouraging those that are single, that if it's your will and, and, and they're in agreement with you to remain single, that you would just help them and strengthen them. I come against the spirits of lust and fornication and masturbation and perversion and pornography. I bind it up, rebuke it, and command to leave each and every listener, including myself. I loosen us clean hands and a pure heart. In the mighty name of Jesus, I loosen us an unquenchable uh, hunger and thirst for God and to fill ourselves up with uh, 
with service and love for God, whereby we don't feel the need to um, copulate or to, to have sex outside of marriage. I just lose that strength and that ability to contain and to to walk in the spirit, to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I just lose that upon every listener that feels the leading of God to be single or the desire of God to, or, or a desire to be so. I lose that upon each and every listener in Jesus' mighty name. I want to thank you for listening. If any of you would like to donate, you can um, look below uh, the video and there's a place to click through. Everything we do is free. The music that you can download uh, at www.reverbnation.com forward slash without spot or blemish ministry music. There's a link below. You can uh, download all that for free. I just ask that if you feel led to make a donation that you would to without spot at gmail.com on paypal.com. And there's a link for that below as well. And uh, like I said, everything that we provide is free, but if you'd like to donate, you may do so. I no longer work in the world, so your donations are supporting me in this ministry. And I just want to say a big God bless you to all of those that have donated. And may God richly bless you a hundredfold back in return for giving to and supporting this ministry. And I praise God for you and for all of those that will donate in the future. God bless you. Another way that you can give to this ministry is just to pray. Pray for this ministry. I really appreciate that. Also, be praying for each other and for the other people that are listening and and uh, those that have suffered um, with attacks from narcissist Jezebels. And get out there and try to help others yourself. Try to minister to others yourself. I'm going to tell you that that is one way to get healed. Once you start knowing truths, a lot of you have listened to so many videos on narcissist Jezebel spirits or so many... Uh, you've studied it out and you have a lot of knowledge right now and God's put a lot in your heart and you aren't sharing it with other people because you're afraid to. You don't think you're worthy or you think you've got to heal more. But what you don't realize is when you start helping other people, that's when you heal. So get out there and start to help other people and God will heal you. And you'll be surprised at how depression, sadness, grief will, will flee from you when you're helping other people. There's just something about God gets your back when you help people. You know, there's a proverb that says that that when you give to the poor, God is the one that's going to pay you back. And giving to the poor and needy is not just those that need money. It's those that need spiritual help. So get in the Word. Read your Bible every day. Feed on it. It's the bread of life. Read it out loud. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And then let what God, that bread that God puts in you, that, that spirit of life, come out of your belly as living waters to bless other people and God will heal you in return so give and it shall be given pressed down and shaken together and overflowing and I'm not saying that to say give to this ministry although I will receive your donation but I am saying that there's more than one way to give and it's not all about money it's giving of you what God's taught you so that other people can be set free and healed so if you can set your mind to do those things God will bless you for it Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Without Spot or Blemish Ministry Podcast.
God's heart does yearn For you to be Among his kin for eternity But so far away If you walk and stay On the other side With the gates of hell you will collide A Jezebel A Delilah too Bathsheba on a roof A look in you were through A Jezebel A Delilah Bathsheba on a roof You can still come back to You can still come back to Come back Come back to God, my dear friend Come back This isn't how Jezebel, a Delilah too Bathsheba on a roof, you can still come back to The house of God with a repentant heart Turn your back on sin Find a brand new start You can find